Well, it's true, there is somebody who controls everything, even the behavioral patterns of all the animals on the earth. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV, taking you through the Bible for the 31st time. It's really exciting. And as we go through the Bible, Corey helps us to understand more. Corey? Today I'm focusing in on Job chapter 38 and how it relates to cylinder seals. Ryan? Well, today my focus is actually on Job 40 as I attempt to identify the monumental monster called in Hebrew, Behemoth. All right, that's a great monster. There's a couple of other monsters there too, like Leviathan and all the rest of it. Very interesting. Janice? Today, my segment is called, How Great Is Our God? Very good. Well, we're going to learn about that as he begins to ask Job questions and all kinds of things going on. So take your Bible out and let's turn and let's discover with your Bible guide what God is saying. Job 39, verses 1 through 12. Do you know the time when the wild mountain goats bear young? Or can you mark when the deer gives birth? Can you number the months that they fulfill? Or do you know the time when they bear young? They bow down, they bring forth their young, they deliver their offspring. Their young ones are healthy, they grow strong with grain, they depart and do not return to them. Who set the wild donkey free? Who loosed the bonds of the onager whose home I have made the wilderness and the barren land his dwelling? He scorns the tumult of the city. He does not heed the shouts of the driver. The range of the mountains is his pasture and he searches after every green thing. Will the wild ox be willing to serve you? Will he bed by your manger? Can you bind the wild ox in the furrow with ropes, or will he plow the valleys behind you? Will you trust him because his strength is great, or will you leave your labor to him? Will you trust him to bring home your grain and gather it to your threshing floor? Job chapter 39, verses 1 through 12. Today, we begin the, the study of Job chapter 37 to 39. It is fascinating. This is God talking to Job. Now, remember that Job had said a lot of things setting this up. And he had said, God, why don't you answer me? Why don't you answer me? Job did not know that he was being tested. And so now God comes out with a lot of questions for Job. And when God unexpectedly confronts Job, he more than fulfills Job's demands by asking him 83 rhetorical questions. And that is, God is asking Job question after question that he clearly cannot answer. Now, Job is claiming to be the servant of God who, it seems at first glance, has offended God through the, the demands that God hear his case. Well, that's something that we often say. But Job has forgotten, as we do, in his pain, that God was watching and listening. And that, of course, is hard. When God's listening, you, you know it. Listening to everything that was said and claimed by his companions. But the Lord is confronting evil in the mind of Job. Further, the questions are not merely for Job's answering, but to bring about more questions for God in eternity. We have much to learn from the Lord because we don't understand the spiritual world. Now, this is where the problems begin for Job. He was being tested by God Almighty himself. Now, this is a fascinating and a great study today as we come upon the end of Job, because as we begin to look at it, you learn something that you've never heard before from God. And it's really interesting. So today, God's answers. Now, this is fascinating. Job 39. We're going to go into the middle here where God is asking these questions. And we're going to look at it. So let's pray. Father, in Jesus' wonderful name, help us to hear your word. And help us to listen to you as you begin to speak to Job and the things that you say to him. 
and help us to confront the evil in our lives that have come in and sort of made their way in our thinking. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' wonderful name. And we all said together, amen and amen. Now, if you have a Bible guide, turn to today's passage. It is a great passage. And if you don't have a Bible guide, my question is, why not? We would love to send you one. Simply write to us. The addresses, of course, are coming up on the screen. But another place that you can get it is BibleDiscoveryTV.com. This is our website. BibleDiscoveryTV.com has a front page, and you click on that page, it'll take you to a place where you can make a donation. Thank you so much for your donations. They're very important to us, so thank you so much. I trust the Holy Spirit's work in you, and God will speak to you accordingly. Now it'll take you to a page where you can get to the PDF files and see and hear exactly where we're going and what we're doing. Now, this is fascinating. Let's look at the scripture, Job chapter 39, Verse one says this, and this is God speaking. Do you know the time when the wild mountain goats bear young? Now think about that. Do you know the time? Or can you mark when the deer gives birth? Can you number the months they are fulfilled? Do you know the time when they bear young? They bow down. They bring forth their young. They deliver their offspring. Their young ones are healthy. They grow strong with grain and they depart and they do not return to them. God has ordained the behavioral patterns of all the animals in the world, all of them. God has done that because God is the creator and God is also the designer. He is the perfect one. And sin has really messed things up, beloved. Now, when we look at nature, we have to understand that we are looking at something that is tarnished by sin. It's not exactly what it was. It doesn't look exactly how it should because it's tarnished by sin. Everything is tarnished by uncleanness and sin. This is because of Adam and Eve in the first couple when they did not do what God asked them to do and they doubted the word of God. So we have to keep that in mind in the back of our head. We don't look at nature and say it's perfect. It's not perfect. We have to understand that. Very, very important. Now, let's go on to the next passage. It says in 5 through 8, Who set the wild donkey free? Who loosed the bonds of the onager? Whose home have I made in the wilderness? And the barren land is his dwelling. He scorns the tumult of the city. He does not heed the shouts of the diver driver. The range of the mountains is his pasture, and he searches after every green thing. You know, God continues to talk to Job about the details of what he's done, because God is the true shepherd of every animal on earth. We are not. We are not. There is a bigger plan afoot that we cannot ignore, and it includes all of creation, all of creation, not just us. It includes everything, beloved. You know, Romans 8 says that uh, the creation waits in groaning for the revealing of the sons of God. Do you understand that the creation itself is also suffering in sin? You know, you look at roadkill and everything else and you begin to understand this isn't right. This isn't the way it should be. And yet that's the way it is because of sin. And see, beloved, we must understand that things have so warped themselves out of perspective that we have to see God. And when we come to Jesus Christ and know him and learn him, we learn much about God. Now, 9 through 12 says, will the wild ox be willing to serve you? Will he bed your manager or your manger rather? Can you bind the wild ox in the furrow with ropes or... Will he plow the valleys behind you? Will you trust him because his strength is great? Or will you leave your labor to him? Will you trust him to bring home your grain and gather it to your threshing floor? Again, God continues with these questions. And that tells us something very interesting. Not every animal can be tamed or domesticated. God is the only one who truly is in control. Humans are not the most powerful in the world. God is. Humans are not the most powerful in the world. We like to think we are, 
But that's not true, beloved. God is the one. He's the one who is in control. He's the one who has power. So when we read these things, we begin to explore what God is saying to Job. He's saying, Job, you don't know. Now, Job's attitude changes dramatically, and we'll get to that one on the next program. But I think it's important that we remember what Job learned here, because we've seen the suffering. We've seen the complaints. We've seen the miserable comforters of nothings that Job calls them. But we've also seen the truth about God. Job was being tested by God. And we must remember that, beloved. Today, let's remember that our life is not composed of what we think is desirable, but building the kingdom of God. That's what we need to focus on. Let's get our minds wrapped around that. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Well, it's time now to carry on with our Bible study. And today, my study is actually focused on Job chapter 40, because here, God refers to an incredible creature, which he calls behemoth. Now, while a lot of Bible commentators identify this creature with an elephant or a hippo, the description clearly doesn't fit either of those animals. But if behemoth wasn't an elephant or a hippo, then what was it? Well, it might be fruitful to look to the fossil record for some answers. The awe-inspiring behemoth described in Job chapter 40 has left so many of us to wonder just what exactly this creature could be. The word behemoth is literally a plural form of a common Old Testament word meaning beast. Practically all translators and commentators have agreed that this word is an intensive or majestic plural, so that the meaning is something more like colossal beast. Though many have suggested that the behemoth is an elephant or hippopotamus, Neither of these animals really fit the description, especially in regards to its tail. It's hard to imagine how the unassuming tail of an elephant or hippo could ever be compared to a cedar. But if the behemoth isn't an elephant or hippo, then what exactly is it? The reality is that there is no known living animal that adequately fits the description. And when we consider that roughly 150 to 200 species of plant, insect, bird, and mammal become extinct every 24 hours, it becomes apparent that the animals alive today represent only a small fraction of those living in Job's day. Interestingly, if we look to the fossil record, we do find some massive beasts worthy of such descriptions. We know them today as dinosaurs. And of particular interest here is the sauropod type sporting massive bones easily comparable to bars of iron, as well as enormous cedar-like tails, this subgroup of the lizard hip dinosaur is a real possibility. Of course, this conclusion absolutely flies in the face of conventional wisdom, which separates dinosaurs and man by more than 65 million years. Nevertheless, the Bible teaches that man and dinosaur walked the earth together not so very long ago. Real-world data such as the soft tissue and DNA found in dinosaur remains to the various depictions of these creatures in ancient artwork supports this godly wisdom. So based upon the description found in Job, the sauropod type of dinosaur really seems to fit the bill. Now if this is so, then this would mean that Job saw these incredible beasts alive. Now, of course, this conclusion fully contradicts evolutionary thinking, but it doesn't contradict the facts, and that's very important. As I mentioned in the segment, dinos and man living side by side is consistent with what we're observing with dinosaur remains. Uh, for example, many dinosaur remnants that have been recovered actually contain soft tissue and even DNA, and some dinosaur bones have even been carbon dated with positive results, meaning that these remains can't be more than thousands of years old. The idea of dinosaurs and man living together is also consistent with the many ancient artifacts found worldwide, which bear stunningly detailed images of dinosaurs. 
Clearly, these ancient people saw these creatures alive, and this is absolutely consistent with what the Bible teaches. Because according to the Bible, dinosaurs as land animals were created on day six of creation, the same day as man. Very interesting. And I think one of the things that uh, people would be asking the question about is because a lot of people have conspiracies today and a lot of people have ideas today about flat earth and everything else. We're not denying the facts. However, the facts are denying billions of years. <laughs> and so we've got to look at that and say, well, something's wrong here. There wasn't this, this well, the catastrophe that they say happened with the asteroid and all that. It seems that there was a global flood mm -hmm. that changed everything. Absolutely. And that shifts our thinking about time. And we take the Bible to explain that. So the difference is, do you take the Bible to explain history? Or do you take man's ideas and his creations his, in his mind to explain history? Exactly right. Well said. Yeah, it gets very interesting as you look at this. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. Good report. Corey? Okay. Biblical imagery is up on the table today, specifically imagery that we find in Job chapter 38. Now, verse 14 in chapter 38 is talking about the sunrise. And as the sun rises, the sun begins to, the, the light of the sun begins to light up the landscape. And this landscape is said to be revealed as a signet seal. And um, this, because it's talking about the sun and the light gradually revealing the landscape, uh, is likely then referring to a cylinder seal as it rolls across a lump of clay. It is revealing the pattern uh, of of the cylinder seal. So we get th we get this really really cool imagery that would have been well known to Job uh, and and his friends as well as the audience that you know would have originally been reading Job would have been very familiar with this concept of a cylinder seal. So let us let us right now also get familiar with cylinder seals. In the times of the Bible, documents like peace treaties, sale of land certificates, business transactions, adoptions, marriages, and the like were authenticated using the ancient version of the signature, the seal. Ancient seals as we know them came in two forms, the signet or stamp type and the cylinder type. They were used to impress wet clay in any form by either stamping or rolling. Seals were miniature works of art that ranged from half to one and a half inches tall and were painstakingly carved from stone, though there are examples of glass, bone, and precious metal seals. The artists that dared to create them not only had to work in reverse for the seal to impress properly, each seal had to be unique, distinct enough to serve as a recognizable signature for its owner, as individual as the person themselves. The material or stone type that was chosen may also have had meaning, with a certain kind of stone being chosen for a perceived benefit or property. Seal artists also utilized individuality in the stones themselves to make their work stand out. There are examples of seal designs incorporating marks, splashes of color, and lines naturally occurring in the stone to enhance the seal's appeal. These signatures were worn in several ways. Signet types were often mounted in a ring and were either worn on the finger or hung on a necklace. Cylinder seals had a hole drilled through their center like a bead through which a mounting pin would be placed so that it could be worn in a few different fashions, most commonly in a necklace, bracelet, or on a clothing pin. Thousands of seals and seal impressions have been found from antiquity. It's believed that the oldest seal ever found is a signet type from the 6th millennium BC. Cylinder seals were in popular use in Mesopotamia from around 3400 to 400 BC. 3,000 years of prominence eventually put to rest by writing materials. Clay as a writing material was slowly replaced by papyrus paper, which would be bound and sealed with a lump of clay that was easiest to stamp. Within the heyday of the cylinder seal, however, signet seals were also in use, especially important for the Bible during the first millennium BC, the time of the kings. Seals appear in many biblical passages most often reflecting their general use of giving someone's authority to a transaction or document, but also sometimes in symbolism. Famously, in the Song of Solomon, the female speaker asks to be placed like a seal over your heart, like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death, its jealousy unyielding as the grave. 
This verse seems to reflect the practice of seals being buried with their owners. As seals represented the essence of their owners, they were common grave goods. So the love of the romantics in the song went beyond the here and now into the next life. So I think it's pretty easy to see here when we look at this, uh, the ancient artistry and technology that was the signature cylinder seal. This imagery, this word picture that's utilized here in Job 38 really comes alive for us. As a cylinder seal revealed its images, its nooks and crannies, its landscape, as it was rolled across a piece of clay, so the earth reveals its shape as the sun rises and the light from the sun begins to gradually hit the landscape of the earth. So this is a really beautiful picture that we get here in Job 38 verse 14. You know, it's interesting because as you see that and as you reveal that, you begin to understand that God uses spherical objects as he produces the imagery. For example, and I believe this, it says that in Isaiah 40, that the earth is round or a circle. That word in Hebrew actually means sphere. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and as you look at that, you have to keep that in mind. Right. It's very important. Yeah, I, I'm really dedicated to keeping biblical imagery in context. So so I think, you know, you're kind of alluding to some people have tried to take Job 38, 14 out of context and use it for some ideas that the Bible is not talking about. So I think we need to be really, really careful when we're looking at biblical imagery and, and read it in the context of the culture, the obvious context in which it was in which it was created. Yeah. And here in Job 38, that's what we see. So that is a respectable and a responsible, I should say that is a responsible way to interpret the scripture. And let's not be foolish here. There is a responsible way to interpret the scripture and there is an irresponsible way. There, there are many uh, that's right. to do it. So that's right. keeping good. it in context is one, Thank a you, responsible Janice. way. Well, we're looking at these chapters today in Job and oftentimes it can be easy for us to forget the magnificence of the greatness and awesomeness of our God. And as God begins to direct questions at Job, in chapter 38, we see him talking about the creation, the foundations of the earth, and some of the, the elements that are around us that we that we often miss or we take advantage of because we see them all of the time, not understanding in its fullness where these came from. And that's our magnificent and great God. And then in chapter 39, it takes us more into nature where God is asking Job, do you know when the deer gives birth? Do you see her time coming? And, and he's asking all of these rhetorical questions to Job and it, and it helps us to understand God's nature and his magnificence. And, um, as I'm thinking about that, uh, as I was planning for this segment, I thought about my dad telling me about a few years ago how he was visiting his sister in Arizona. And uh, he and my mom and my aunt drove to the Grand Canyon to take a look at it. And it was his very first time. And they pulled up and they walked over to the edge and they were all just in awe, now my aunt had been there several times, but my mom and my dad, that was their very first time and they stood there and just looking at this huge canyon and, and it was either my aunt Carol or my mom that said to him, Al, Al, sing, how great is our God? And so he said, Janice, he said, I, I got out, how great is our, and he said, I broke down crying. And he said, the three of them just stood there and wept looking at the magnificent sense of what God had created and actually looking at that, that was the result of sin, the result of the flood and these things that God can even in our sin filled world that our nature has been affected, not only we ourselves, but nature itself has been impacted. The beauty that is still there makes me wonder what heaven, what the, the new heavens and the new earth will be without sin, the way that God originally intended it. So how great is our God? Then that brought me to a little chorus, Corey. 
<laughs> I remember you singing, and you said you still love to sing it to your boys when you're in the car or whatever. It was the only chorus that made your little one Matthias stop crying.、Mm -hmm. And I'm going to try to sing. If you want to join me, you can. But, but this is, <laughs> that's okay. I will let you do it. <laughs> but this one is for all the little kids out there, or people like me who are kids at heart. Our God is so great, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing our God cannot do. The The mountains are his, the valleys are his, the stars are his handiwork too. Our God is so great, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing our God cannot do. Our God is so great, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing our God cannot do for you. And that's the truth. Wow. Hmm. Our God is so great. Let's not forget that no, he's magnificent.、Mm -hmm. He's wonderful, and he is willing and waiting to meet with you. The Creator of the universe is waiting to dialogue with you. That's how much he loves you. Don't miss out on your opportunity today. Don't miss out. Because today God is waiting to meet with you. He's waiting to change you. God will change you. Just open your heart to Him. Invite Him into your life. Through Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and rose again, He will come in. As we finish this particular time of、uh, the program where we pray, we need to think about some things. First of all, we need to think about the Lord. How do we serve the Lord? And we say, Lord, we pray this way. We say, Lord, I need to hear you, and I need to see you work in my life. <laughs> I don't need to just talk about it all the time. I need to actually do it. Help me to do it, Father. I'm ready, and I submit to your will, and I will do your work in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.